We pray that this morning you would bring your word to life in our lives and in our hearts. That it wouldn't just be words printed on a page, but it would be your will imprinted on our souls. That you would write your law on our hearts. And that we would find ourselves just becoming more like you for spending some time in your word, letting your character reflect on us. I pray, Lord, that you would bring out things in the passages of the chapter we're going to study this morning that would be relevant to our lives and would encourage us as we seek to follow you. And we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we looked at Joshua chapter 1. And as we are traveling through the book of Joshua, we have been looking at it in terms of living a victorious life in Jesus Christ. And the first thing that we saw in chapter 1 as God spoke to Joshua and gave him some very special promises and also some uh, incredible charges for what he was supposed to do, we, we saw that it's important for us as a believer to have God's promise in our lives, God's presence going with us, and God's proclamation of his word always at the forefront of our lives, meditating on it day and night, never letting his word leave our mouths. And I've had some great conversations with people through the week who have uh, felt that reminder to really continually meditate on God's word and just how much uh, joy and how much encouragement that brings to our lives. Well, so now we come into chapter 2, and now is the time when Israel must actually think about the fact that they are going to go into the promised land. But before they actually set foot into the Jordan River, and we'll talk again about that next week in terms of what that means for the Christians setting forth in victory in their life in Jesus Christ, first off, they have to send some spies into the land. First of all, to spy out their biggest adversary. Now, it's kind of like the Lord, isn't it, sometimes, where we think we're just going to kind of ease into things and, and go about things in a small way and kind of grow, and he does that too sometimes. But here for the Israelites, they face their greatest enemy, it seems, right off the bat. And for us, sometimes our greatest enemy is uh, what Jericho can represent. And a lot of folks say that the Jericho for us really represents the world. And the king of Jericho represents Satan, who is the god of this world. And sometimes we see the world as this giant edifice, this big, tall towers and these giant walls that can never be scaled and never be brought down. And we think, we can't, we can't fight against the world. It's just too pervasive. It's too ubiquitous everywhere we go. Our culture surrounds us, and we're, we just can't help but be like our culture. Well, we can. And as Israel will gain the victory over Jericho, so too we can gain the victory over the world as it attempts to bring us down and keep us from having a victorious life in the Lord. Now, the uh, leader, Joshua, has to send some spies into the land. And they, in this particular case, are going to have to actually get wet in order to uh, find Jericho because the uh, Jordan River that they have to cross, as we'll see next week, is at flood stage. And so it was a pretty major river at this point. But they had to get in the water, swim across, and then make their way to Jericho, which was really only a few miles away. Now, it's not like they could just stroll up to the gates of Jericho and say, all right, guys, we're the Israeli army. You guys just need to give up. And it just wouldn't work that way. They would have just laughed at them and come out with arms and killed them, and that would have been that. And, you know, it's, it's also that way for us when we try to come against the world and its influence in our lives. We can't just stroll up and say, all right, just get out of here, give up. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Satan doesn't give up that easily. But it doesn't mean that victory cannot be ours. But actually, in order for us to have victory over the influence of the world in our lives, we have to give up. Not to the world, but we have to give up on our, our, our own strength, on our own ability to be able to win without God. 
We need to give up trying to figure the world out and instead focus on worshiping the Lord and putting Him first. And then we are able to discern how He wants us to step forth and win that battle. So this morning, we're going to look at chapter 2. And we have two groups of people, really. We have the spies that I spoke of. But then we have the person whom the spies met. A woman that we're going to get to know a bit this morning by the name of Rahab. And it turns out that both the spies and Rahab are kind of foreigners in that city. We'll see more about that here in just a little bit. Let's begin here in chapter 2, verse 1. Joshua, the son of Nun... Sent, men, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and they lodged there. Now Rahab uh, had her home, as we'll see, actually in the wall of the city of Jericho. And it was the, the red light district of Jericho. And these, that's where these two spies came to her. Her name actually means proud or roomy. Those are the two things that the word Rahab mean. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about her, the meaning of her name in a little bit. But why, why come into the gates of Jericho and, and they're spies, and they're trying to figure this place out and, and, and check out the, the city and the land in preparation for Israel to come in and God to win this victory. So why in the world would they go to the house of a prostitute of all places? Well, there are several reasons that, that people conjecture about that. Uh, one is perhaps that uh, maybe it wasn't all that uncommon for there to be a pros- house of prostitution there in Jericho, that it was just so sinful that uh, maybe every other house was a brothel. We don't know exactly. It's also possible that they didn't dare go very deeply into Jericho because of the fact that it was enemy territory. They looked different, and as we're going to see, even the very little little bit they went into town, got them recognized as being the enemy. So perhaps they went into the gate and said, okay, look, here's a house. Let's go over there and see what we can learn, trying to keep themselves out of sight and out of harm's way. It's also possible, and I think this one's kind of interesting, that uh, they went into a prostitute's house because they probably wouldn't have had as much suspicion risen, uh, uh, raised, raised up about them in town. Uh, you know, if people are going into a uh, house of prostitution, you know, the others that might be in that neighborhood might not be that likely to talk about where they were at the time. You know what I mean? So maybe that was one of the reasons that they went in there. But there's also another reason, and I'm going to get to that as we look at verse 11, something that might actually be not only the reason they went there, but a reason why they got the kind of information that they needed when they came into Jericho. So we'll see that here in a little bit. So in verse um, 2, they, they come into the house of, uh, of Rahab and they lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the lands. So it, was, it was getting to be about dusk when they went in, which was a pretty smart time. Uh, we here in the United States, uh, we have this illumination that's kind of around us all the time, right? When it gets dark, what comes on, if, unless you live way out in the country, uh, the, the street lights, right? And so, and, and even when at night here in Newburgh, when we look off to the, to the, uh, to the northeast, there's like this glow in the sky from the, from the city of Portland. And so it's never really all that dark. But what we learned when we were over in Kenya, in a place where electricity is sparked, if non-existent out in the bush, that when nighttime comes, nighttime really comes. And just in order to see, when we were staying in Pastor Medeño's house, uh, when dusk begins to appear, they come around and they have to light hurricane lamps. And they have them all lined up on a shelf. And so at one point, somebody comes along and lights all these lamps and sets them all around the house because otherwise you'd be walking along and you'd trip over something and fall because it gets dark. Well, so here these two spies are coming in right at dusk time, right when it's really hard to really make out what's going on and the eyes have not adjusted yet to the darkness. So it was the perfect time for them to try and hide, but as we see here, they didn't do a really good enough job. Maybe their disguises weren't perfect or something. Who knows? But it says that uh, some, some 
people went to the king of Jericho and said, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I don't know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. So Rahab's house built kind of like right up against the wall. So one of the walls of her home would have been the wall of the city. And then she would have had a flat roof on the rest of it. And so what they would do is they would dry the grain they would bring it up and just dry it on the roof like that. And so she had all these stalks of flax up there. And so she said to the guys, all right, come on up here and we're going to hide you. And uh, again, the fact that it was dusk probably aided their their ability to hide because if it had been daylight, you know, the stalks of flax might not have been all that great a covering, but it was in this particular time of day. So she takes them up there and and hides them. Now, she says some things to the authorities, the police, or the uh, Homeland Security, or whoever it was that, uh, you know, the CIA, or I guess it would be the JIA, no, anyway, uh, who came to... uh, you came to talk to Rahab, and uh, she comes across as a pretty good liar. And uh, one thing that we shouldn't do from this particular scripture is think that, oh, well, I guess the Bible must condone lying then, because uh, that's not true. But I do find it interesting that in this particular case, when doing the will of God to protect the, the, uh, the people of God from certain death, it was definitely allowed. And and the Bible does not uh, condone her lying, but neither does it condemn it. Kind of reminded me of what some Christians did during the reign of Nazi Germany, where they would hide Jews in their basements or in their attics or in false rooms in their their houses. And so the the, uh, SS would come and they would say, are you hiding Jews here? And they would say, no, we're not hiding Jews. They were lying. But yet it was to protect the people of God from being massacred. And uh, I don't want to introduce some sort of relativism into, uh, into uh, serving God, but there really is, if, if someone's going to be murdered and you have to lie to protect them from being murdered, I think it's probably okay to do that. But pick it very carefully and be sure that you're actually, you know, doing what the Lord would want you to do in a situation like that. I don't, that's never happened to me, and I doubt it's ever happened to any one of us. But Rahab here uh, does lie in order to protect these guys from being discovered. So then, in verse 8, before the men lay down, so you know, we kind of go back now. Here's a, here's a flashback. As she's going up the stairs to the roof of the house, she's you know pulling apart the flax, and she's going to cover it over with these guys. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof, and she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and all the inhabitants of the land melt away from you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in the heavens and on the earth beneath. Wow! What an incredible statement that, that Rahab makes. And, and I really love this because it really begins the story that we see uh, symbolically of the story of salvation, of God's grace and, and of God's salvation. Here, Rahab kind of represents us. And, and we uh, are, many times before we come to the Lord, we're very proud of who we are. And, and we think we're doing pretty good. At least I did before I came to know exactly what state I was really in. I, was, I was pretty, thought I was pretty cool. You know, I thought I had my act together. But then uh, she realizes, as we do, how much in, how much in peril we really are. As we realize the fact that we are sinners and that God has judged 
the world. And we have to escape this. And the only way to escape it is to throw ourselves on the mercy of God who is righteous. And so she confesses her faith in God. And then she cries out for God's mercy in verse 12. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will do deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death, if you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. And so um, she asks for their mercy. She knew, she know, knows here that she's a sinner, that she is under God's judgment, and that, she, and that her and her whole city will be, will be destroyed. And yet she throws herself on God's mercy to say, Look, save me, bring me out of this place. And um, they tell her, uh, as she, in verse 15, she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land... You shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. If anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in this house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. So there are lots of great symbolism about what, what happens here and what she does. One of the things this reminds me of is the Passover where uh, back in Egypt, when God was about to rescue his people by keeping them from suffering the death of all the firstborn in the land, he had them kill a lamb and um, take its blood, kind of scarlet or red colored, and paint the doorposts of their house. And he said, if anybody goes out of your house, out from underneath the blood of this lamb, they will die. But if you stay in your house, you will be saved. Just as, as Rahab is told here, gather all your family into the house and tie the scarlet cord out the window as a sign. And as long as you stay indoors, as you stay in the covering, if you will, of the scarlet cord, then you will be saved, you and all your household. And I think it's interesting because um, this is actually a great picture of salvation. And on Wednesday of last week, we studied the scarlet cord because it's a picture that God paints of salvation throughout the scriptures. And if you're, in, if you're curious about how that works, you can uh, go on the website and you can download the study and, and listen to what we uh, discussed. I'm not going to go into detail on that here. But what we find here is that this picture of Rahab is the picture of salvation by faith, and then that faith working out through action. Rahab, you see, is in the line of Jesus Christ. She ended up escaping from Jericho, and uh, she is David's, King David's great-grandmother. And then, of course, you know, the line goes down on to Jesus Christ. Rahab herself gets in what we call the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, where the author of Hebrews says, by faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. So it showed her faith. She confessed the truth about herself. I live in a doomed city. We are all going to die and we know it. But also confessed her faith in God. who God is, is able to rescue me from this peril that I'm in. 
But then she's also found in the book of James, which if you've read the book of James, you know that one of the, the uh, uh, ways that the apostle focuses his epistle is on the activity of works in the life of the believer. And he says in, in chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So here we have an example of Rahab's faith in God and also in the works that she did, which is basically faith in action. And the works didn't save her, but the works of what she did in response to her faith and her confession of the Lord showed that it had taken, that it was real, that it wasn't just lip service. She wasn't lying to the spies that had come in saying, oh yeah, you know, rescue me, ha ha, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't really mean this. No, she did. She was sincere and she showed that sincerity by the fact that she sent them out secretly by another way and she laid down that scarlet cord which would have marked her. Now the, the world might have not understood what that marking meant, just as sometimes the world doesn't understand what we mean when we confess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we put that faith in action, as our lives begin to change and the Holy Spirit begins to work inside of us and we find our lives being different. I've, I've shared this story before where I didn't know that much about Jesus, even though I'd been raised in the church. I'd never had the, the gospel preached to me. But when I did finally uh, realize what was going on and the fact that I needed to give my heart to Jesus Christ and confess him with my mouth, I did that. And I still didn't know very much. I just, I found myself picking up the Bible and reading. I, I think I told you the first book that I started reading was the book of the Revelation. You know, go figure, you know. But, uh, uh, and I just found this hunger for God's word. You know, I didn't, I, I wasn't really discipled that closely or that carefully by anybody. I just found myself wanting to read God's word and, and uh, begin to have a relationship with him. And I, uh, I used to have a pretty foul mouth. And I found myself about six months after I had uh, come to the Lord, Margaret didn't necessarily know of all the, the foulness of my mouth because I was trying to be really nice to her because we were dating at the time. <laughs> But I found myself, I, I, it's like one of those moments where you begin to reflect on yourself for a moment. I found myself realizing about six months later, hey, I'm different. Something's happened inside me that has changed the way I speak, changed the way that, that I act, changed the way that I think. That was the faith that I had put in Jesus Christ being worked out in my life as the Holy Spirit began to make changes in me. So here we have Rahab, who has faith in the Lord, and then it's worked out in action by her saying, all right, guys, go out secretly this way, let, let you down in the cord, uh, uh, with this cord, out of the, the city wall, and by the way, come back and please rescue me. Now, I mentioned at the beginning about why is it that the spies went to the house of this prostitute, Rahab? What is the, what was the reason? And I, and I thought about this and I'm just suggesting this. I haven't, you know, I didn't like pick this up from some commentary or something, but I just happened to think, okay, you're Jericho, right? And you feel pretty smug about your, in your, uh, the, the, the strength of your city and, you know, you, nobody can come in and get us. This was, by the way, the first walled city that, uh, that Israel had come to and it was quite a fortress and it wasn't something where somebody could just come on in and attack them. If you are the military leadership of Jericho, do you think you're walking around the streets quaking in your army boots and going, oh no, Israel's coming? I don't think so. I think you're probably showing off the bravado of how your city has been so impenetrable over the years and how nobody can get you. So you're coming across as this really confident uh, general and, and, and army officers and so forth in almost every situation, except perhaps if you were to have visited this house of prostitution and perhaps it was there, letting their guard down, so to speak, that the army officers might have revealed to Rahab, as perhaps no one else, the true state of their mind, which was terribly frightened 
of what God had done through these people. So in reality, it's quite possible this was the perfect place for the two spies to pick up the kind of intelligence that they needed to in order to bring back the report for Joshua, which is exactly what they needed to know, what, exactly what uh, Joshua needed to know. Now, why were they so afraid? Two things are mentioned here. First off is the crossing of the Red Sea. And that one's a good one to bring up because next week we're going to see how God performs the exact same miracle coming out of Egypt to going into the Promised Land. He dries up the, the Jordan River. And so they, obviously, the people heard about what God did in drying up the Red Sea. The Israelis were able to cross, and then as soon as they got across, and all the Egyptians came, you know, charging after them, and they got off into the, into the midst of the, of the Red Sea, and God said, oh, okay, I think I'm done now, you know, lets the wind go, and whoosh, the water comes back in and drowns all the Egyptian army. You know that story got told. And it made its way to Jericho, and they're going, no. And they're coming here? Now, this was 40 years after that event took place, and it still lives on. And the works and the miracles that God does, especially the miracle of salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, carries on even 2,000 years later. The story told by eyewitnesses carries the same kind of power today. That's why Paul could say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. Don't ever underestimate the power of the gospel in someone's life. It is the thing that can go through the hardness and the walls that people have put around their hearts and can and say to them, yes, I am indeed in peril, and I need the salvation that only God can bring. So the Red Sea crossing was one of the things. The second thing was this uh, business with Sihon and Og. I always think that's a good name for a, a baby, wouldn't you think, you know? <laughs> Og. I'd like you to meet Og. <laughs> you expect somebody named Og to kind of, you know, I'm Bob Og. Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> Numbers... <laughs> Numbers chapter 21 is where we read about this, this situation. There were two kings, and they stood between Israel and the promised land at the northern end of the Dead Sea. And they won a great victory over Sihon and Og. And, and because of this, and because of the nearness of these kings to them, you know, they probably knew Sihon and Og or had seen them in parades or, you know, on TV or whatever. And... Um, because of what had happened with Sihon and Og, also another thing took place, um, which was um, it caused, uh, the, these were two um, uh, Moabite kings, and, they, and, and there was another Moabite king whose name was Balak, who then called forth a guy named Balaam, if you guys rec recognize that name. And Balaam was called out to try and quell this incredible string of victories that Israel was having on their way, marching into the Promised Land. And if you know the story out of uh, Numbers 22, uh, every time that Balaam tried to call down curses from God on Israel, they just came out as blessings. And poor Balak is going, I didn't hire you to curse, to bless them. You know, look at your contract, man. You know, you're supposed to to curse them. All right, all right, all right. Let me try again. And so he goes back and he comes again. And you know the story. It just keeps coming out blessing. And then finally, Balaam says, look, look, O king, if you want to get these people, here's how you have to do it. And then they ended up sending in Moabite women to tempt the men of Israel into sin. And a terrible thing happened where the, the people of Israel got all caught up in this uh, terrible sexual sin that was going on, and they en ended up having to, a bunch of them ended up getting killed. And so the, the point was, if you can't win over God's people with face-to-face -face battle, you try to win them through tempting them to sin. Now, I say that because that's going to become key as we continue our discussion about the perils that face the Christian as he or she wants to lead a victorious life. Sometimes it's not the face-to-face -face battles that are the most dangerous for us, but it's the subtle temptations of the enemy that try and draw us off course and draw us into sin and then becoming ineffective for the Lord. But so anyway, um, she 
lay, uh, lays out the scarlet cord as, as a sign so that when the people come back, uh, they will, they'll rescue her instead of destroying her with the rest of the city. And that's exactly what happens. We'll see that in chapter 6. But I want to talk a little bit about the spies now, okay? Because this wasn't the first time that Israel sent spies into the land, if you remember. Not too long after they came out of Egypt and crossed the Red Sea and were making their way straight up to the promised land, they come up to the border and Moses says, all right, God wants me to send in some <clears throat> spies into the land. And so this group of spies go into the land, and they come out, and they say, Oh, no, we were like grasshoppers, you know, in front of them, and, and they were the Nephilim, and, and, you know, yeah, it's got a lot of produce, and it's great and all that, but we'll never be able to win over them. And, and uh, there were two guys that went along with them, one of them whose name was Joshua. And he came back and said, No way, man, these guys are nothing. God can do it. And he continues that attitude later on. But because the spies brought this bad report, the rest of the Israelites rebelled against God and they did what they had done a number of occasions. You know, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us? We're not the graves in Egypt good enough for us. And, you know, what are you doing, God? We're just, you know, you know, the rebellion. Um, But these spies... These spies that crossed the Jordan and went in to check out Jericho were of a different character. And they were there uh, not really to study the Jericho missile defense system and determine the exact route of entry and where the weakest part in the wall was and devise this incredible military strategy in order to win over the town. All they did was to go in, find an ally and discern the attitudes of the heart. And that's the only intelligence they really needed to know, and that is that the people were fearing God, and there was a person of faith that they found within that city. Now for us, when we are trying to determine how to win victories in God, whether it's over the world, or whether it's over difficult circumstances, or, or over the enemy that comes before us, sometimes I think we make the mistake of going in, and we try to discern the world's missile defense system. You know, we try to figure it out psychologically, exactly the best way to approach this, so that it will have the greatest effect, or we analyze the situation based on the factors that are set before us, and we think, well, this is impossible. I can't win over this. And we try to figure it out on our own. When in reality, God tells us that the victories that he will win for us are not based on our ability to figure out what's going on around us. It is simply our job to trust in the Lord that he has already won the victory for us. And not only that, but in Romans, Paul says we are actually more than conquerors through him who loved us. Because we have God on our side. He is the one. When we face serious enemies, now we might suffer some battle scars, as Paul said in that section in Romans chapter 8. He said, for your sake, we're being killed all day long. We are going to be part of the battle. We're going to see that in the coming chapters. We are participating. We are cooperating. But it is God that's that's winning the victory. We're just walking in it. Yeah, we got to have our arms with us. And we got to do some work. But he's the one that knocks the walls down. It's not us. We aren't just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Now, it doesn't say we are superheroes. We are only conquerors in that God has done the conquering for us and that we have fellowship with him. Now, that's what I call a victory. So, in verse 22, they departed, went into the hills, and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened to them. Now listen to what they say. Here's the difference between the two groups of spies. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. That's awesome. Now, there are lots of symbols and things that we could talk about in terms of Jericho and what it represents. And one of those that I would be remiss unless I reminded us of is that really, indeed, Jericho does represent the world. 
Rahab represents really the church. And those that have realized their peril in God judging a sinful world, who have confessed their faith and put their trust in the Savior in order to rescue them from this peril, and have laid out the scarlet cord so that when that judgment occurs, they will be brought out safely. Even as this world is under the judgment of God, and one of these days, pretty soon now, God's going to come back and judge the world, but he's going to rescue out of that judgment those that have place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so there's this kind of uh, biblical timeline and end times uh, kind of tie-in to the story that we have here of Rahab and the spies. But I want to focus just as we conclude this morning on these two groups of people once again. First off, uh, the spies. Now maybe you are like one of these spies. God has sent you on a mission. You felt him calling in your heart to step out and to do something for him. And notice again what their main focus was. They were looking for an ally and they were trying to ascertain the attitude of the people. And so too with us when we are sent on a mission by God. Now that could be anything. That could be just uh, bringing a cup of soup over to a sick friend or um, talking about the Lord to a neighbor that you have had a relationship with. Uh, Even just, you know, going to work every day. That type of thing. We do some intelligence work. We see if there are allies in this place that we are at. And I remember when I used to work as a uh, a television reporter, and I was just so encouraged when I went to that place of work on a mission from the Lord, representing him, because we are ambassadors for Christ wherever we go, to discover that although they were few and far between, there were other believers in that place. And I had the privilege of being able to work with one of those as a photographer. And so we would be able to band together and pray together for strength as we faced what is uh, understandably a very ungodly profession. And so for us, it's good for us to find allies where we are. In the place of uh, another place that I worked, uh, we discovered there were a group of Christians, and so we would we gathered together at lunchtime, and we would pray for the needs of of those that gathered, and also that the Lord would bring salvation into that place. Um, and so uh, we partner with them, and then we discern the attitudes in the place where we are, and that's where really prayer comes in as the Lord's battle plan, as we ask God to win over the place that that, that we are, the place that, that, that he has called us to be. Well, maybe you're not one of the spies. Maybe you are like Rahab. Maybe you feel stuck in Jericho, and you know the place is going down in flames, but you just feel like you're stuck there. You have no hope to prevail against this mighty God that is coming The judgment is right around the corner. You're presented with a choice. You can continue to align yourself with those that are surrounding you and just go with them into judgment. People that you know are really the enemy. Or you can reach out with faith and trust that God will save you out of this wicked place. And then you use your actions to really acknowledge that promise. And Paul the Apostle, once again, in the book of Romans chapter 10, he puts it this way very simply. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You see, there really is truly a peril that awaits this world and all who are in it. Because of rebellion that we as a race have done against God, he has had to separate himself from us because he is pure and holy and he cannot exist in the presence of anything that is not holy because it will be obliterated. It's kind of like walking without protection into the middle of a nuclear reactor. You have no hope of surviving in the presence of God if you are not pure and holy like him. And there's only one way that we get to be that way. And that's by realizing that we are under judgment because of sin and the nature that's within us and for us to reach out and to believe that what God did in sending his own son to the earth to live a perfect life and then give himself as a sacrifice, a payment for those sins 
and then giving our hearts to that, that sacrifice and confessing him, saying, you are my Lord. I give myself to you. That's the way that we come into a rescue. And that's really what salvation is. That's what being uh, the Savior is. It's a rescuer from the peril that we have found ourselves in in planet Earth. So just in conclusion, um, as we begin to face this uh, enemy that would keep us from leading a victorious life, and make no mistake about it, when you begin to step forth in your life in Jesus Christ... There is an enemy out there who would do anything to keep you from serving him, to keep you from following him, to keep you from doing his will, because he recognizes the peril to those he has held captive. And he knows that if God's got a bunch of people out there that are willing to step out and share the power of the gospel with other people, he's in trouble. And so he is going to be doing everything he can in order to dissuade us from this battle. And I hope that we see in the coming weeks how God can win the victory through our lives despite the power of the enemies that we see around us. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this picture of faith and salvation. And we thank you for this picture of those who were willing to step out and to um, really ascertain what was going on in the world around them in order to um, bring about faith in the people that would uh, be walking in this victory that you are going to bring. And I pray, Lord, that in our lives you would bring us to a place of faith in you. Realizing that the enemy that is around us also quakes in fear because of your mighty power and the great victories that you have wrought. And that we should not fear them either. And Lord, I pray for any of those who are here or within the sound of my voice who, um, are like Rahab, are living in a world and realize that it is a condemned place because of sin. I pray that you would bring them to a place of faith and trust in you for their salvation. That they would throw the scarlet cord out of the window of their hearts saying, Lord Jesus, I know that you died in order to bring about my salvation. And I pray that you would come and rescue me from this sinful and condemned place. Thank you for bringing about salvation in the hearts of many people today. And thank you for bringing about victory in our lives as we step forth in you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.